Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Alastair Stevens. I'm very pleased to pronounce uh, and present this uh, presentation on one of the assets that Lindian has, which is our Kangang Kundi Rare Earth Project in Malawi, something I nicknamed the King because most people have a lot of trouble getting their tongue around the word Kangang Kundi. Um, we have assets also in bauxite in Guinea. Uh, there's about a billion tonnes of high quality material there, but I want to focus today on the rare earth asset, which is Kangangkundi in Malawi. I won't spend too much on the corporate overview, just to say we've got about $20 million in the bank, uh, 2,409 shareholders and 1.15 billion shares on issue. Um, this is the team, uh, the board, myself, and the project delivery team made up of people with the appropriate skills to deliver this project. A um, bit of background is that we had shareholder approval to acquire this project for US $30 million on the 29th of September 2022. So all the project um, uh, works that we've done to date, which is about 20 months, has been completed in a 20 month time frame. We want to, we now know, we thought we had a great project. We now know that the resource is significantly sized, that we could be a leader in uh, the rare earth industry. And we want to position this as a great value, low cost producer. We have, uh, I'll prove to you that we have an environment where we can be a, a very low carbon footprint, very sustainable. We've got the capacity for growth and we've developed a very strong relationships with our community and maintain that because they've been great supporters. So let's talk about the asset. Location in Malawi, which is a country in the southern and eastern part of Africa, bordering the Lake Malawi, which is uh, 650 kilometres long, 150 kilometres wide by its deepest, about almost a kilometre deep of fresh water. Um, so that's Malawi here. The project is in, towards the south through a town called Blantyre, which is a major commercial centre of about a million people, and just south of another town called Balaka, which has about 36,000 people. The site is down the M1 highway. It's 20 kilometres by road to the turnoff and another five kilometres from the M1 to the project location, where the red box is our mining licence, the blue box is our exploration licence around the outside of it. There's a 66 and 132 kVA power line running up parallel to the highway off a hydroelectric power scheme. And the dashed lines here are the railway systems that go out to the east, to Nakala, and to the south, to Port Bira. So it's ideally located around some fantastic infrastructure. So I'll come back to this slide at the end. I want to start with this. It's a fully permitted project. So we have a mining licence, we have an ESIA certificate, we've got our explosives permit, and now we have a water permit just um, this last month. It is a massive resource. Uh, it's a simple Mopan pit mining operation. I'll give you some flavour around what that looks like. It's a gravity separation only technique, and I've taken the flow sheet out of this presentation just to uh, so I can talk about more about the project rather than uh, manipulate you through what the flow sheet looks like very low capex and low opex. We have gone to tender for this project uh, since December through about 10 uh, different entities and we've come down to a short list of two. So we're particularly confident what our capex number is. It's plus or minus a several percent at this point in time. Um, and we are 90% complete on our, co our opex numbers as well. So I want to prove to you at the end, this is a superior asset with superior quality product. Um, and the business model, I'll step you through that too, with massive scalability in the future. And if I just touch on that for a moment, this is specifically designed to be a project which is an entry stage into the rare earth market. We're not going out there with a big bang. It will produce around about 10,000 tonne per annum of rare earths, of which 20% is NDPR, so that's a payability factor with the position that this exercise will start for three to five years. We'll engage with the industry about what stage two looks like in the future. So there's a growth opportunity beyond this, apart from what we're gonna to present to the market and shareholders. Um, we're very close to actually, uh, we've completed a drill program for an indicator resource uh, calculation. That's very close to being published within the next week or two. Um, we've already got a resource of about 261 million tonnes at 2.2% rare earths for, the main number there is 1.2 million tonnes of NDPR. That's the most um, important um, aspect in terms of financial outcomes for the business. We've completed all our ESISAs, we've got an environmental management plan, all the other criteria that you expect to come into a feasibility study. Uh, we're particularly close to that. In fact, I think the way it'll land, it'll land in, in probably in May. 
So apart from that resource of 261 million tonnes, 5.7 million tonnes of rare earths, we've done some other exploration around. So just like to highlight here, this dashed line is the limitation of the 261 million tonnes of resource. We do know that this area is also mineralised because we've got deep drill holes that went through um, mineralisation around this perimeter, which is not part of the MRE. We've done some exploration to the south. There's a place called the Southern Knoll. Assays there are going 3, 4, 5 and 6%. Uh, in the northern knoll to the north, they're going from 3 to 7% rare earths. So there's additional potential to actually extend mineralisation in the surface footprint. We stuck down two drill, deep drill holes. This is a section looking uh, east, so that's north and south, and that hole there is therefore replicated as this hole here in this section, which is looking north, so that's a west-east section. The first intersection we got was 854 metres at 2.73%. Uh, and the second drill hole was 1,000 metres at 2.6 with 805 metres at 2.9. Importantly, they are below the limit of the MRE, which is this base here. So it's very easily to project the fact that this is not just uh, one multiple of 265 million tonnes. There's two or three additional potential resource um, um, and ability to improve the resource at depth. So do we want to drill? Do we want to get a bigger resource? No, we want to go into production. So our whole focus at the moment is engineering studies. Um, so this is a snapshot of what looks to be the first probably 40 years of mine life. These are the first two areas of focus, what we call the northern pit and the western pit, this being the resource block model for the entire inf inferred resource. So we're just looking at a very small patch or patches of the mineral resource as our first stage of development. Um, we're articulating a process um, flow sheet of 60 tonne per hour, which is around about 450,000 tonne per annum. Um, and the target for those two areas is to identify about 20 million tonnes of resource. So there's plenty of, um, of potential um, mine life there just within those first two pits. And then we'll work on the rest of the remainder of the resource as an expansion study into the future. I've take, as I said, I've taken out the flow sheet. Let's just talk metallurgical numbers. Recovery of 70%. Concentrate grades it depends upon, your yeah, recovery depends upon the concentrate grade. So we're getting 70% recovery at um, a 60% concentrate grade. The best concentrate grade we've got is 68%, which is quite unusual because the theoretical molecular um, ideal formula for monazite mineral is around about 72% rare earths. So it gives you insight into the quality of the material we've got. Um, and one of the important aspects there is radiation. It's got no radiation. And it's been, been deemed by ANSTO to be uh, non-radioactive for the purposes of transport. So it's a general goods product. Lots of things that flow out of that, apart from um, reduced amount of um, management time associated with radiation management, which we don't have. We don't have radiation management in transportation. Our transportation costs are cheaper because it's not a class seven good. But the most important one is then the dexterity you've got of commercial saleable product. It's general goods, non-radioactive, so you can sell it wherever you like. Um, and for those that are interested, there's the breakdown of the rare earths. As I say, the payability there of 20.2% NDPR. Is, um, is what's important from finance. So here's a snapshot of what the rare earth process chain looks like within the industry. This upstream process of producing a monazite concentrate, you've got these midstream and downstream processes, which is hydromet and then manufacturing components. Our business model is to stick in that upstream model, mining, beneficiation, and selling concentrate in bag material to our customers. That means we can sit in a low capital cost, low technical risk and uh, highly leveraged um, uh, end of the market where our costs versus our prices have greater ratios than downstream processing. So let's talk about the market just for a little bit. This is data out of Project Blue. So the blue bars there are the history of, rare, of NDPR demand. So the important aspect there is from 2010 to 2020, NDPR demand doubled from 10,000 to 20,000 tonnes. The projection here is either the, the trend um, going forward, that blue line, the historic uh, projected trend going forward. By 2030, there's around about 20 extra 20,000 tonnes of NDPR needed in the market. If you look at what um, 
other uh, projections are based on uh, commodity draw, then you're looking at around about 50,000 tonnes of extra NDR, NDPR in the market. So rough, our sale plan is around about two 2,200 tonnes of NDPR. It's a drop in the ocean compared to the growth of the market going forward. So it's easily accommodated within the, um, the rare earth market. So that's a verse pro uh, value proposition is volume growth. The second one is price growth. And what I've tried to do here is match up all the prices that come out of most of the broking houses, uh, which I've listed at Can Accord, uh, Morgan Stanley, um, Baron Joey, UBS, Gold, uh, uh, Goldman Sachs, Petra, um, and then the Project Blue, which is a database. And it's an interesting trend. There's one here that says the prices are going to increase, uh, you know, a um, little bit more um, linear over time. And these ones that think they're going to jump out of the, the, the blocks in 2026 back to the 120 and 140 dollars per kilo mark. And the red dot line is then the average, which looks to be around about $120 or so over that time period up to about 2033. The current price at the moment, I think, has strengthened to about $65. It was down as low as 48, but we're seeing improvements in the market at this point in time, which is very encouraging. Now, third demand is uh, market demand. NDPR is um, the, sorry, 90% of the market value is in the magnetic materials in the rare earth market. So it's that bar over the side here. 90% of the value is in uh, NDPR plus TBDY. Um, and the volume that we've got here is NDPR is about 97.5% of the magnet market. There are NDPR battery, uh, magnets and then there are NDPR magnets that are doped with TBDY for specialised purposes within um, high temperature environments. It keeps the performance of the magnet going better in, in those high, magnet, uh, high temperature markets. So ultimately you need NDPR to actually unlock TBDY and the TB, um, sorry, the NDPR market needs TBDY to actually bring on uh, further development of those specialist batteries. So it's a symbiotic relationship of which I hope to fill the NDPR component of that. So if you're looking ahead and come back to it, just a reminder, we're fully permitted. What's going to come in the next couple of weeks is an indicated resource update, which will then lead us into an ore reserve calculation. We're doing our mining schedules, preliminary mining schedules at the moment, and they'll become finalised uh, at the end of the uh, indicated resource campaign. Technical studies are complete. Our CAPEX and OPEX numbers are essentially 98% complete, so we're very, very close to actually releasing what's really important for the market is our feasibility study, our project valuation, and then um, uh, um, information to the market about what is the c commencement of stage one construction, which I'd have to say at this point in time is either going to be late this quarter or very early in the third quarter of this year. Um, now back to community, we've been very, very careful about how we engage with the community. So the top left there is ministerial visits from the uh, mines minister and the local MP to site. Uh, the bottom left-hand corner there, I have to say the Australian government's been particularly good in, in having um, events in Malawi and in, inviting and engaging community members into um, the forum where, where the government has been able to support us. Uh, and that bottom left-hand one, they said, was one of the few meetings where we've actually had the three chiefs or chiefs from the local m mining area. So this, this chap here is uh, the traditional area senior chief. His name's uh, Chantunya. Um, Chris is uh, a consultant who works for us in Malawi. Doreen is an Australian government representative. Uh, Makalela is our local area village chief. Um, uh, she's just a, a, a really lovely lady. And then um, oh, this one's got, this guy's name's Nkosi Chantunya. This one's uh, Herbert Chantunya. Um, and they are all very well engaged and we keep them very much informed as to what the program uh, of development is in this program in this project. We also engage with the local community members. There's various subcommittees under that, whether it be forestry or community engagement or community development committees, and they're all engaged in a, um, a collaborative process. We've also taken, um, uh, borrowed geologists out of the geological survey. So this is Sarah, uh, and that's a sample of drill core from 954 metres or thereabouts, that's 7% rare earths. Um, so we've had various geologists come out of the Geological Survey on the site and help in uh, the, the, the drilling campaigns on site. And it's been a symbiotic relationship where they've learnt stuff from us and we've learnt stuff from them. So it's been particularly good exercise for both of us. 
So this one, I, I really love this particular slide because this is a positioning strategy of this project going forward. I've talked about access to hydroelectric power. I've talked about gravity separations being our processing technique. And that leads it then into we have virtually a zero chemical footprint operation apart from some chemicals at the back end of the plant in the thickener for flocculant. Um, so we don't have chemicals, it's not flotation, it's gravity, it's water only, and the bore water there is almost potable. Um, we have sustainable access to sustainable power. It's a hydroelectric power grid, and that we can get for about off the grid at nine and a half cents per kilowatt hour. So not only is it particularly cheap, it's also uh, carbon neutral. And environmental care, and I tell the story there where um, some missionaries have bought a block of land just south of that town called Balaka. And they bought it six years ago. And all they've done is just left it untouched. And the amount of regrowth that has come from that particular plot of 10 hectares is unbelievable. It's a forest almost six metres tall, whereas around it, where the community is, they're mostly a sustained um, um, subsistence um, community. So they live off the land, so they need charcoal, so they chop down the trees. So it's a cycle where trees and forestry doesn't get to regrow because of the intensity of the natural, of the humans um, working the environment. If you leave it alone, it'll regrow. And that's one of the best reforestation programs you can have. On the mining licence, just leave the forest regrow. In community, um, we've got an articulating com um, programs where we bring local community members at various levels from unskilled to skilled to semi-professional to professional and help build skills within the community, obviously jobs. And future electric mobile fleet is interesting because we're mining a hill. Uh, Kangangkundi Hill stands about 200 metres above the surrounding plain and our initial mining operation will be at the top of the hill um, with almost a zero waste stripping ratio because part of the hill's gone and the high grade sits on the face and behind it is low grade mineralisation. So where we've got dilution, we've actually got mineralisation sitting behind the ore. And in fact, that low grade mineralisation gets stockpiled and basically reclassified as a um, measured reserve because it's been drilled and stockpiled. So here we have a truck going up a hill, empty, being loaded and coming back down the hill full. Whereas, you know, underground operations or below, below surface operations, you're going down empty and you're pulling all back up the hill with a full load. So your, your fuel consumption is very different. In electric fleet, you are great, there's greater challenges going uh, uh, down and coming back up. There's greater um, uh, stress on the batteries. Here we have an operation where we can take an electric mining truck potentially up the top of the hill fill it full of ore and have regenerative power going back down the hill through its braking system. So we're not starting with an electric mining fleet. We're going to start with diesel, we're going to start with diesel light vehicles and over time once we've de-risked everything else we'll start introducing one truck here and one um, electric um, light vehicle here and there into the operation and see how they perform um, and that I think gives us a pathway to a genuinely carbon neutral operation gravity separation, hydroelectric power, regrowing the forest, community engagement and potentially future programs where we can eliminate most of our diesel consumption with an electric mining fleet. So that is just, an, you know, and then you say, what's the product do? The product goes into materials that are carbon abatement technology. So it's just formulating itself into a great um, story to go forward in terms of sustainability. Now, if I go back to that, that um, initial uh, plan where I had the two mining pits in amongst that great vast mineral resource. Those two pits are probably going to last 40 years before we actually get into our expansion studies and go into that mineral resource further to the south. So you can see this also has the potential to have mine life of 100 or 200 years. In fact, there's 150 million tonnes of material sitting between the top of the hill and ground level and therefore at 1.5 million tonnes per annum there's a 100 year mine life. So this has enormous potential for um, involvement within the rare earth industry, great shareholder value, great community benefits. And hopefully um, one of the aspects of this project, I hope it actually builds and, and facilitates greater diversity of supply and therefore greater balance within the rare earth industry. A snapshot in Malawi, which I won't go too, too far into, it used to be a British
electorate, so it's got an English system, a Westminster system, a parliamentary election and taxation system which is not unfamiliar to an Australian with 30% tax and 5% royalties, about 75% Christian population. So ladies and gentlemen, that's my presentation for uh, Kung and Kundi the King uh, Rare Earth Project. We're a developing company now. We've moved past our exploration and resource development phases. We are, will be in operations within a short time frame. Our longest lead time in our construction is those multi-gravity separators, and that's a 40-week lead time. So it gives you an indication of when we start uh, the process of going into developing. It's about a 12-month lead time before we're into commissioning and construction. And so if we're actually constructing in the second or third quarter of this year, then by that stage we should be, fourth quarter of next year, we should be commissioning into production. We've got plenty of opportunity for growth and we've got quality product. Remember, go back to the concentrate. It's going to have a water-based, low-carbon, almost a net neutral uh, carbon footprint of a non-radioactive material going about 100, um, 120 kilos of NDPR per tonne of concentrate. So it's a particularly high-quality product as well. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.